All right, sweet. So, Sean, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. Doing real, real good. Glad to talk to you. Oh, I am super excited to talk to you. I think I told you a moment ago, first time I heard your voice, I think that was that's what kind of done it for me to start off with. I heard your voice and I was like, who is this guy? Who Who is he? You know, I didn't even, at first, I didn't register everything that you were saying. I was, I was just attracted to your voice. And I was like, okay, listen to what he's saying. And the facts kind of, it tied in with the beauty of the voice. And I was like, yeah, this guy is a gem. <laughs> that, thank you so much. That means a lot. That, that really does mean a lot because it's my voice. So I never really think about it, yeah. but you know, I hear that a lot, but having, I guess, a tool for people that might be pleasant to, to listen to but also rich with energy, rich with content, rich with empowerment. You know, I think that's all kind of in the tenor and, and texture there. So yeah, that means a lot. Thank you. Oh, no worries at all. No worries at all. And congratulations on your book, uh, Eat Smarter. Um, how long has that been out now? It's, I, I had no idea because the time had flown by. It literally came out a month ago today, essentially, which was uh, December 29th. And as I mentioned to you, it's, it's um, unbelievable. It became the number one new release book in of all books in the United States. So this is going up against wow. like fiction and nonfiction books. It was in the top 10 of all nonfiction books purchased in the United States that week with like Matthew McConaughey, Barack Obama. Seriously. So book, seriously. Wow. And this is a book about health. It's not about fanfare, not about politics. It's so, it, it was so inspiring and encouraging for me because I know that this matters. Yeah. And it's a part of the conversation that's not being talked about, which is how do we actually get our communities healthier, our world family, our world citizens healthier, mm -hmm. so that we can eradicate so many of the issues that we're dealing with. Our health is the fundamental piece. It really is, it really is. What do you think was the main thing that caused such a, a, a I don't know, a big rush in your book? Why was everybody rushing for it? Like. I mean, there's loads of health books out there, yeah. but this is great. But I want to know, what did you do? Like, teach us. Like, is it is it because of your name? People know you or was or it just the, the information that's in it? You know what? That's that's a powerful question. There's two parts to it. The first part is there's a statement that's really been just sticking with me for the last two years as I've been writing this book. It's this, this quote that says, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, right? There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Right. And this idea and focus on real health, like what does that actually look like? How do our bodies work? Just this kind of inner intelligence. It's really this time in human history, we've never got such a glaring, obvious picture of how poor our health is. As a, as a society, as a human species. You know, many of us, like we're well aware that we're the sickest nation in the history of the world. You know, if you look at the United States, we have over 200 million of our citizens are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. We've just got about 350 million folks to begin with. And half of our population right now, 43% are clinically obese. We're on our way to 50% within the next few years. It's unbelievable. But we coupled with that, 135 million folks are type two diabetic, or pre-diabetic right now already, 115 million chronically sleep deprived, regularly sleep deprived. I can go on and on and on with the stats. It's absurd. So when I say that it's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, there can't be a problem without a solution, right? So that's part one. The second part is I'm a nutritionist. You know, I've been in this field for 19 years, many years as a science researcher, 10 years as a clinician, working with patients. And I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of things. And here's, this is the biggest thing. And to, and to directly answer this question, what really set me apart in this work apart is the last book that I wrote, which was Sleep Smarter. And it became this international bestseller. I'm a nutritionist. I was not intending on creating, you know, this big massive book on sleep wellness. It was just a conversation piece that was missing from health, really, you know, this was back in like 2013. And since it became the first sleep wellness book to become an international bestseller. And since then, many other books have come, come along and it's changed, it changed the market. It changed the lexicon, the conversation that we use. And I just did an interview for Tom Brady's company, uh, you know, this multiple Super Bowl champ, 
but he yeah. has a company called TB12 and they have sleep wellness coaches, you know, so I'm talking to their team. These guys are using, they don't even, many of them don't even know me, but they're using language. They're using terms that I put together <laughs> that, you know, that's the power, man, of things that kind of trickle down and become a part of the culture. So to answer the question, that book put me in a different stratosphere. So now when I talk about food, I have a lot more people listening. And I also have the opportunity over the last few years with that book, you know, now I've taught, you know, neuroscience classes at NYU, I've been able to, you know, speak at Google and all these big organizations. And to be able to connect with other people who are doing extremely powerful things in this field, and to learn from them, and to also learn where they're not connecting, and yeah. put all of that together in one resource for folks to just be able to digest and consume, because that's what a book really is at the end of the day. It's taking decades of, of experience and, and, and enabling somebody to absorb all of it within a matter of days. So it's incredibly powerful. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, really did it. Over answered it. Thank you. And that's the thing. How many years did you say? 19 years of um, experience in your fields and all compressed yeah. in a book. That's yeah. powerful, man. No wonder everybody's running after it and it being sold out. It's, uh, I definitely need to check it out myself. So let's talk about food metabolism. What is, uh, like, why is body fat not really the culprit where uh, um, it's made out to be? Mm -mm. What's yeah. your, yeah. This is, this, is a, this is a fundamentally important question because obviously, you know, you being in this space and just, what we've seen, again, a lot of folks, this is a big struggle for many people, and we're trying to target our body fat. We're trying to kill fat. We're trying to burn fat. And we're trying to get rid of something we don't even understand. We don't know what it is for most of us, just on a superficial view. And I'm saying this from very deep experience. You know, we'll just say I've got 30 close relatives that I grew up with. 28 of them are obese, all right? Oh, wow. And they, these are good people, smart people, but they were really kind of disenchanted and miseducated about what the whole process looked like, right? So number one is understanding what are we actually dealing with here when we're talking about burning fat. And so in Eat Smarter, I take people through and we talk about the different fat cell communities because the fats that we're trying to quote burn, these are called storage fats, all right, storage fats. And there's three subcategories of, of this storage fat. One of them is subcutaneous fat, right? So sub, a lot of people might know this term, this is the fat that's directly underneath your skin and, you know, fat on the back of your arms, on, on your legs, on your butt. You can have some on your, on your waistline as well, but this is the stuff that you can pinch. And subcutaneous fat is incredible. It is one of the most important. This body fat has enabled us to survive in times when food is scarce. It's very, very good at holding on to energy for when we need it. As a matter of fact, this is one of the big struggles that we have today is that this fat is incredibly good at doing what it's programmed to do, all right? right. But our lifestyle is very different from how we evolve, where we have 24 seven access to all manner of creation and, and even mutation of foods. And so they're just constantly, you know, our fat cells are just storing and storing and storing. So subcutaneous fat, then we have visceral fat. And this is the most dangerous type of storage fat, but also it's an evolutionary adaptation because we should have a little bit, but this is that deep abdominal fat, like putting pressure on your abdominal organs. So it's also called, called omentum fat, which translates from a, a word meaning fatty apron. All right. So okay. this fat is, this is kind of harder to get your hands on. It's harder to the touch, but this is what we think about when we say quote belly fat is visceral fat. And visceral fat is a classic sign of insulin resistance. All right, so I'll just put that in, in the pocket there. The last type of storage fat, and this is in my university classes, and I paid for this education or lack of education. <laughs> I was taught that muscle and fat are dichotomous. Like they don't really, they're two different things. But intramuscular fat is actually fat that's integrated with your muscle as on-site energy for your muscles to work, all right? So okay. literally, if you're working out, doing different, if you're strength training, if you're doing some high-intensity interval training, if you're even doing, you know, uh, slow, uh, steady-state cardio, your muscles are using that intramuscular fat as fuel, all right? So 
to get a picture of what that looks like, think about the marbling of a steak. All right, that's kind of what's happening with our bodies. But here's the thing, even the, that type of storage fat can get out of hand and you can get what we call, quote, chubby muscles. All <laughs> right. right, okay. So these are all storage fat communities. And again, they're just programmed to do their job. They're just very, very good at it. And when they get out of balance, and the last little piece here that I'll share within that storage fat community is the fat cell. And you cannot indiscriminately kill a fat cell. That's not how it works. When you're born, you have about the same number of fat cells that you have now, all right? right. But what happens is the fat cells themselves get filled with contents, right? We'll just say in the form of these packets of energy called triglycerides, right? So blood fats. And over time, your fat cells can literally, it could become a hundred times bigger, a hundred times its original size, getting stuffed with things. So our goal is to get the fat cell to open up and release its contents. And that's not the end of the story because it can get reabsorbed somewhere else. We want to get it shuttled to its end destination. And for our conversation, intents and purposes, just to keep it simple, the end destination, the power plant is gonna get burned at is the mitochondria, all right? right. So any smarter with taking people behind the scenes for the first time in book form, which is crazy to say this, and teach them how the process works. How does fat loss work? Where does fat go? Where does it go when you lose it? You know, like yeah. demystifying this to really put the power in people's hands and also what specific foods and nutrients create the pathways, create the hormones that make these processes work. So that's it in a nutshell. Wow, wow, that, that was powerful. That was powerful. Lots of different questions was popping in my head as to, you got some people that say they find it very difficult to lose fat as well. And, and you got some who lose it easily. And, you know, you got some people that might eat terrible food, but they still manage to lose a lot of body fat. And then you got those that eat really well, but they can't seem to get rid of it. Yeah. What would you say is the situation there? This is so good. It's such a good question. And this, again, I love this because you've seen it. You've seen it firsthand. You just described so many people's situations. Mm. And what it really boils down to is the most overlooked thing in all of nutrition. And I, you know, again, I, when you ask that first question about how did this book take off? And I mentioned that I know the guys. It's like, I know the top person in every diet framework. I know the guy who made the keto diet popular. I know the guy who made the paleo diet popular, the vegan diet popular. These are all my friends and colleagues. The thing that's not talked about in their frameworks is that every single person has a very unique metabolic fingerprint and their diet framework is not going to work for every person. And I'm saying this from experience because in my clinical practice early on, fortunately I woke up but early on, if I was into a certain diet framework, that's what the patient was going to do. <laughs> if I'm into this, because I just believed, hey, this is the, the way, you like the Mandalorian, this is the way. <laughs> and I would have you, you're going to do what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. And eventually, thankfully, and this is where science is finally really starting to, to, go, to go, is I have to do what's right for this person, for their unique metabolic fingerprint, even looking at their their lineage, you know, what, what, what did their close ancestors eat? You know, maybe they're coming from a part of the world where, you know, these particular foods were abundant in the diet. Now this particular diet that they're trying to do strips that food away and maybe it's feeding a certain strain of microbes that's been protecting them against autoimmunity or protecting them against weight gain. The list goes on and on and on. So the biggest thing and why there's so much confusion right now, and also again, folks that they're cutting their calories they're, they're working their ass off. They're really, really working hard. And yet they're not getting the results that the next person is. And what we know from the data now, we can have, and this is something very, the most important thing from my perspective, that's going to really integrate itself into our culture, just like with Sleep Smarter. The most important thing from Eat Smarter is this new term called epicaloric control. All right, epicaloric control. So what that means is it's above caloric control. And there's seven factors that I've identified in the research that control what calories do in your body. And if any of these factors, or especially for most people, it's a combination of these factors, is not addressed, we can have two people on the exact same diet. They're at this exact same height and weight. 
on the same diet, same exercise program, they get the same amount of sleep for the entire year. One of these people can burn 100,000 calories more than the other person because of these factors controlling their metabolic rate. All right, so we see this, but now we're actually bringing science to it, where we see somebody who, you know, they can quote, eat whatever they want and they don't gain weight. Whereas their other friend, if they even sniff a cupcake, <laughs> they, their, their butt starts, you know, jiggling, getting a little bit more hang time. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is a real thing. And so these seven factors, and I would love to share a couple of them because I want everybody just to be able to walk away and like understand what's going on. Why are, why is my metabolism different from the next person? And what can I do to, to kind of fix the system that's controlling what calories do in my body? That'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be perfect. Awesome. Perfect. I'll, I'll just share three of them really quickly. Three of the seven. Yeah. So I use an acronym for them. But since I'm just sharing three, I'll just jump right in and share what they are. Yeah. One of the most remarkable, and this is, this again, this is something we talk about, but now we know for certain that this is real. We say this all the time. It's not just the calories. It's the quality of the calories. No, I mean, this is, this is really, really serious. So listen to this. So one of the studies that I break down in the book, this was published in the journal Food and Nutrition Research. And what they wanted to do was find out what happens with somebody's metabolism when they eat a meal of whole foods versus a meal of processed foods to actually find out what happens with calorie expenditure, all right? So they had some test subjects to consume a meal of whole foods, which was a whole food sandwich, okay? So this is what right. they deemed to be whole foods, which was, <laughs> which was whole grain bread and cheddar cheese, all right? So they had some test subjects to have that. Then they had other test subjects to consume a processed food sandwich, which was white bread and cheese product, all right, cheese product. So okay. if people are wondering what is cheese product here in the United States, which is fortunately has changed in the UK somewhat, but mm. Kraft, the company Kraft, Kraft Cheese, their singles, they're called Kraft singles for sandwiches because they can't legally call it Kraft cheese because there's not, <laughs> not enough cheese in the cheese, right? <laughs> that's insane. So, right, that's what cheese product is, all right? So here's what happened. These two sandwiches, and this is the most important part, they're the exact same amount of calories. They're the same amount of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But here's what happened after they compiled all the data. They found that the people who ate the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that sandwich versus the people who ate the whole food sandwich that was closer to nature. And what that really means is this processed food effectively created what I call hormonal clogs that made their body more stingy and hanging on to the caloric density that they just brought in. It literally disrupted their metabolism and ch changed the way their body worked. Now imagine doing that again and again, every meal, even if you're, even if you're managing your calories, even if you're doing the point system, but the quality of food itself could be damaging your metabolism and you don't even know why. Why is the weight not coming off, mm -hmm. All right? So that's number one is the type of food itself determines what calories do in your body. It's not calories in, calories out. That is dead. We're done with that. We're so far past that. But that's what I was taught the very first day of my nutritional science class is that calories control everything. If you control the calories, you control your body composition. Not that calories aren't a valuable metric. There are just these things that control what calories do and they need to be known. Everybody has the right to know this. So that's number one. And I'll share two more really quickly. The second one, and this one is really powerful, man. This one is so powerful. Your brain itself, your brain determines how many calories you absorb from your food. All right. Now, on the surface, this would just kind of seem a little bit logical because your brain is controlling really everything about you and your metabolism. Yeah, hormones. But researchers, right, researchers at Yale University School of Medicine, they discovered that there's, you know, well, I'll just use this piece, the vagus nerve that connects your brain and your gut. And they're constantly sending data back and forth about the nutrition availability in your cells, how much kind of caloric energy you have stored and nutrients that you need. And your brain can signal to your gut to increase the absorption of calories from your food that you eat, or it can tell your gut to suppress and reduce the amount of calories from the food that you eat. All right. And what this is, is kind of like a metabolic thermostat in our brains, controlling your metabolic rate. Mm. And largely this is controlled by your hypothalamus in your brain, 
okay? Your hypothalamus is kind of like the integration of your endocrine system and your nervous system, monitoring your needs. But here's the problem and why so many, again, people are struggling to get the weight off when they're apparently doing everything right. One of the biggest issues creating disruption to our metabolic rate is something called neuroinflammation or brain inflammation. It's an absolute epidemic. Literally, as I mentioned, hundreds of millions of people are dealing with this here in the United States because these researchers discovered that this is a major causative factor in obesity. And obesity is a major causative factor in brain inflammation. Yeah. So they just create this vicious circle and nobody's talking about it. These cookie cutter diets are not like, you know what, we need to reduce inflammation in your hypothalamus so that your, so your metabolism is online and working properly. But some of these diets, they do it on accident, right? They're accidentally helping to reduce inflammation by adding in anti-inflammatory foods and just kind of getting rid of things that are creating the inflammation. And I want to share a quick little nugget, like what could people do? And I know some yeah. people are like, how do I know if I have brain inflammation? I was right. thinking that, yeah, what's, you know, what's a sign of, yeah, brain inflammation? What's, what's the main culprits to cause brain inflammation? You know, yeah, so this is the, the interesting thing about, okay, theoretical physicist, Michi Michio Kaku, right? He's like kind of one of the Albert Einsteins of our day. He said that the human brain is the most complicated object in the known universe. Right? That's a big statement. Nice. And it's pretty cool. And the cool thing is we all have one. We all have one of the most complicated objects in the known universe. We just don't know how to use it very well oftentimes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm bringing that point up because when it comes to this, this process of neuroinflammation, your brain is very protective of itself. And we have an ex, it, even though it's this powerful entity, it's also extremely delicate. Your brain is the consistency of soft butter, right? And so we evolved this, it's the only organ fully encased in hard bone. So we've got like an internal helmet to protect it. I'm sorry, external helmet, but we also have an internal security system called the blood brain barrier. Because truly some, you can eat something and it can kill you. And so your brain needs to protect itself from any toxicants coming in and only very specific nutrients can get to the brain, All right? So now here's the point. Your brain can tell you about pain anywhere in your body. Your brain can tell you about pain in your toes it can tell you about pain in your teeth, but it can't tell you about pain in and of itself because your brain doesn't have pain receptors. Your brain cannot feel pain. So somebody could just get in there and start like, you know, tickling your brain or poking your brain and we wouldn't even feel it. What we would feel is the things around the skull. Like if somebody gets a headache or a migraine, this is associated with the, you know, the, the, the circulation and muscles and things around our neck and our head. All right, so again, you won't know that your brain is inflamed. You will know if your elbow is inflamed because it doesn't have pain receptors until it's too late. So here's how to know. Chances are, because obesity and insulin resistance is a major driver of neuroinflammation, if you are insulin resistant, if you are carrying excess around the waistline, if you are in a state of obesity or overweight, chances are you do have some degree of neuroinflammation taking place, all right? Now, here's what you do about it. Oh, and also, if, you've been, if you know you've been exposed to you know, toxicants, pesticides, herbicides, we've got data that I share in the book as well about them being very damaging, creating neuroinflammation and gut inflammation. So here's how you can repair it. Quick tip for everybody. And this is an advocation for, for you to go and eat these things, but this is what the data shows, <laughs> yeah. all right? I was very surprised myself. But researchers at Auburn University here in the United States discovered that antioxidant rich extra virgin olive oil is now clinically proven to reduce brain inflammation. And it was found to be very effective at repairing the blood brain barrier. The very system that is protecting your brain against inflammation that can get damaged by inflammation and thus allowing more inflammation. All right, so wow. that's pretty damn remarkable that extra virgin olive oil can do that but there's nuance with the type of olive oil to get. You should know all that, all that stuff. I don't know if we have time to get into that, but that's an important thing. But the researchers found that two to three tablespoons a day was had that regenerative restorative capacity. All right, so that's one tip. Also, broccoli was found to be very effective at reducing neuroinflammation. There's several other foods, but again, it's just mm. being aware of this. And I'll just ask you, when we've got a fire, 
right? If there's a fire, what do we go get to put the fire out? Water. Water, right. <laughs> the same thing. Our brain is 80% water, upwards of 80% water. It's one of the biggest issues today is uh, dehydration. You know, like we talk about this stuff all the time, but truly, you know, this is a big driver of neural inflammation is having a dried out brain, you know? And so researchers, one of the studies that I shared, just a 2% drop in our baseline hydration level led to direct decreases in cognitive performance. So decreases in coordination, decreases in executive function, you know, being able to do mental math and recognize where you are in your environment. We essentially, we get dumber when we get dehydrated. It damages our brain, All right? So there's a couple of little nuggets there. And again, those are just two of the factors that control what calories do in your body, your brain and neuroinflammation and the type of food itself. Wow, wow. I have extra virgin olive oil every day. So um, mm. I think my brain should be all right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> hopefully, anyway, hopefully. Um, I do have the occasional, as, as Dave Asprey would call it, kryptonite. But I try and keep that to a minimum. Um, yeah, but I must admit, I don't always have organic vegetables. Um, although I should, it's not always available. So I just try and uh, wash it. What about those? Yeah, if if you can't get organic and, you know, there's going to be some glyphosate, you know, some some pesticide and herbicide. What's what's the best way to deal with that? Would you say just wash or would you have to clean it a certain way? What, what would you say? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and I think there's a lot of misconception about this. The first thing is we don't have to be neurotic about it, you know, especially if we're eating, quote, clean the majority of the time, you know, like everything that I eat is, is not organic or not labeled as organic. But for the most part, we try to do our best because the data is pretty scary right now with various pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, fungicides, what they are, they're designed, the work, the, the, Suffix side means to kill, but they're designed to be estrogenic or neurogenic to small organisms, right? So disrupting the reproductive cycle and or the nervous system. And so one of the most popular and most used pesticides here in the United St States is called chlorpyrifos, right? And I think it's been banned in the UK by now because you guys usually ban stuff way before we do. Yeah, yeah, we are um, crazy. Yeah. So chlorpyrifos, man, study after study, it's scary. Study after study, rapidly increase rates of birth defects from mothers who are exposed to chlorpyrifos, specifically creating uh, brain damage to their babies and radically increasing the rates of miscarriage as well. So it's, it's so ignorant of us to have allowed this to happen for so long and also to, to know that, okay, these are going to damage or they're trying to kill and destroy small organisms. We are made of small organisms. We're made of small cells and our microbes as well. These are small single celled organisms that inherently, you know, again, we think, okay, because I was taught this again in my biology class in college, our bacteria doesn't have a nervous system, right? They're just whatever, they're stupid. The reality is we have our genes, if we go gene for gene, 99% of our genes are from our microbes, right? If we go gene for gene, because we have trillions of microbes in and on our bodies right now, and they might not have a, what we deem to be, and this is the thing, we're just trying to become less dumb, <laughs> right? We really don't know anything, man. As even as we're doing this and we're talking over on the other side of the country, this is miraculous, but we really don't know how this shit works. We're spinning around in the middle of this galaxy we're not even in the middle of the galaxy. We're a couple of rings out in the <laughs> middle of outer space in this glorified snow globe. We don't know anything. I mean, we're just trying to figure out little bits and becoming less ignorant, you know? So my point being that, you know, if we're looking at the, the impact of these things and gene for gene, we have more genetic, micro, our microbe genetics. What we know now is that our bacteria have, they are able to sense pain and then also they communicate with each other. So these are aspects of a nervous system. Pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides, et cetera, massively destroy our microbes 
And we've seen the outcome here in the United States or just in the Western world period. When we look at our microbe diversity versus somebody who's in a cleaner environment, eating and more of their natural diet, we have four times less diversity now in our microbes. Yeah. And one of the studies I talk about in the book, I got it right here, I'm gonna tell you directly, mm -hmm. is published in the International Journal of Obesity, revealed that higher diversity of gut bacteria is directly correlated with less weight gain, independent of calorie intake. And this is one of the third epigenetic controllers is your gut microbes control your metabolism. They control and determine your absorption of calories and your expenditure of calories, all right? right? And as our diversity goes down, our rate of obesity goes up. As our diversity of microbes goes down, our rate of heart disease goes up, our rate of cancer goes up. We now know there's a connection. So to answer the question, number one, understanding how important our microbes are in association to these chemicals, understanding that they have caused mass, here in the United States called pyrophos that I mentioned, it was supposed to be outlawed a couple of years ago, but it's caught up in the red tape right now God. because these companies, man, they honestly, until it cuts into their bottom line, it's not even, in, it's innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. It's innocent until they have enough lawsuits against them where it starts to cut into their profits. And this just, it is what it is. It's, it's really sick. Our, our environmental protection agency here in the United States has cleared and has allowed legally thousands, literally thousands of different pesticides it's insane. And they're supposed to be looking out for us. But so what do we do on the back end? If we can, yes, choose to eat organic. Wild foods are even better, you know. Um, but ultimately, I don't want us to be to be disillusioned and believe that we're doing something where we're not when we think by washing off an apple is going to be getting rid of the pesticide residues, because it was grown in it. It has integrated itself into the very structure of that apple, into the very structure of that berry, since it was a seedling, you know, like, right. let's not fool ourselves that, you know, rinsing this thing off is going to suddenly clear it of pesticides. It's not how it works. <laughs> right. right. Okay. So, okay. You know, but last little point, I'm sorry, is I still, even with all that, I know it sounds pretty messed up and scary. I still don't want us to be too neurotic because our bodies can handle a percentage of insults, it can handle some of it, but when it's that plus this issue, plus that issue, and it starts to stack, that's when we can have major depressions of our immune system, of our metabolism, of our nervous system, the list goes on and on. So it's just being balanced, do the best we can mm. and you know, let the rest kind of fall where they may. Yeah, yeah. That was amazing. I remember reading about the the whole microbiome or shall I say the the bacteria that we have in our body being more than human cells, you know, bacteria cells was more. I was like, wow. It just seemed so interesting, you know. It's not just in our gut, it's on our skin, it's it's all over us. Um and yeah, the, the way it can help us to keep us, I guess, trim, in shape, and feeling vibrant as well. You know, uh, having, you know, diversity would, it, it's like it affects our mood. Like if you eat crap food, you feel bad. You eat good food, food you feel good, right? Um, so talking about that, I actually wanted to move on to um, like emotional intelligence. Now, can you share some of the surprising research on how nutrition affects our relationships on of emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence sorry absolutely yeah well this goes back to the brain again because our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions you know if we talk about the parts of the brain responsible for these things you know your brain you know your dendrites your axons and the gray matter, the white matter, all these little terms that we use to describe the parts of the brain, the different parts of the brain, the amygdala, prefrontal cortex, it's all made from food. So the thing that enables us to have thoughts and emotions, it's made from food. And it's so overlooked in the conversation of health, you know, knowing the top psychiatrists, knowing the top neuroscientists, you know, and, and knowing how little they're actually trained in food, if at all, they don't even know what the brain is made of. Do you understand? It's like, it's a very, very disruptive and damaging 
underlying premise of our system, not knowing what the thing is made of, the organ that the patient, that the physician is treating, because it's made from food. The cardiologist is treating an organ made from food, yet they're, they might get two weeks of training on food and 12 years of education in pharmacology and surgery and treating symptoms of what food is causing or creating, right? Mm. So that's number one, is just understanding that piece. So how does this play out in the real world? Well, researchers at uh, The Ohio State University here in the United States, they wanted to find out just one little thing. What happens if we have deranged or abnormal blood sugar? How does that affect how we relate with other people? Namely, your spouse, right? Your partner. So these are people in a, a, a hopefully loving relationship and they want to find out what would happen if we have deranged blood sugar. And so they put uh, continuous glucose monitors on their body, which is a lot of people are doing today, but this was done a while back. So this was early for them to use this technology and to monitor things. So they could see in real time, if your blood sugar is, a, is affecting how you're connecting with another person. And here in the United States, as I mentioned, 135 million people have chronically deranged blood sugar. 135 million people are diabetic or pre-diabetic right now, all right? And when I say diabetic, I'm not talking about type one diabetic. I'm talking type two, which is about 95 plus percentage of the cases, just to be clear. And so when I say this is an issue, this is a major issue happening chronically for people all day, every day. For myself growing up, same thing. You eat something that spikes your blood sugar abnormally, and you're going to have an associated abnormal crash. You're going to go hypoglycemic. But your body takes your blood sugar extremely seriously. It is like a, an evolutionary adaptation because our blood sugar needs to be on point as a survival mechanism to be able to fight or flee and to manage our environment. Just because now we can hang out, you know, watch Netflix, you know, drive a, a fancy Tesla or whatever it is, we're still, our, our primal, we have very primitive primal programming that's driving 99.9% .9 of what's happening with our bodies, all right? And so blood sugar is extremely important. And to get, when it crashes, your, your body can actually artific, not artificially, but sort of get it back up. It's not based on food. Your body can get it back up by secreting stress hormones. So namely cortisol and adrenaline can get that blood sugar back up to its baseline where it needs to be. And that's all good, all right? Your body can do it. But the side effect is that those catecholamines, these hormones, tend to make us aggressive, tend to make us irritable. And so here's what the researchers found. When they notice, again, continuous blood glucose monitor, when the test subjects had abnormal blood sugar, they were far more aggressive towards their partner. And they were far less likely to be able to perspective take and put themselves in their partner's shoes. And most importantly, when they had abnormal deranged blood sugar, they were far less likely to resolve their relationship conflicts, all right? Now, I know you've seen this, man. Like, at no other time have we seen so much agitation towards other people. Like, everybody's infighting and battling about minutia, arguing. Like, people are getting online just to argue. We're out in the streets just pissed off. We have pissosity going on. <laughs> and we have a, a, a nation, and really many of our communities around the world, of chronically nutrient-deprived, and uh, kind of malfunctioning blood sugar and hormone function that's just like, and let me be clear, it's not that you can't be empathetic and compassionate and patient when you're not well. It just, but true, it just makes it harder. It makes it a lot harder to do. And your gas tank of patience is much lower. All right. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I want to express as part one and, and the last little part here, just to stretch this out even further. And I'll share this really, really quickly because this was done by researchers at Oxford University. And it's one of the most powerful, fascinating studies that I've ever seen. And when I read this uh, quite a while back, I've always wanted to put it into a book so that everybody can know this. this is a virility to books that kind of supersedes a lot of things. So these researchers wanted to find what would happen with prison inmates if they improve their nutrition, all right? So they took a group of prison inmates and, and the great thing about it, even though it's an unfortunate circumstance, 
is that it's a ward, it's called a ward study, meaning that everything is controlled. You're, you can track everything. Like the, nobody can like leave the facility and do something different, right? You're able to track exactly, you know, the specific intervention and the specific result. And so they gave one group of prison inmates improved nutrition through very superficial things, just giving them improved vitamins, minerals, and omega-3 fatty acids, essential fatty acids. And this was a, this is a very important. And then they gave another group of prison inmates a placebo, all right? So this is a multi-month study compiling the data over you know, three to four months. And after they compiled the data, the researchers were absolutely shocked. They couldn't believe it. There was a 40% reduction in behavioral offenses for the folks who got the improved nutrition. And there was a 37% reduction in violence and violent offenses for folks who had improved nutrition, all right? Wow. And the study was so shocking, another set of researchers repeated the study. This was published in the journal Aggressive Behavior. They got almost the exact same outcome. This is real. Yeah. Our nutrition or lack thereof is driving our aggression because the parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, for example, this is one of the last parts of the brain to, that's kind of a top priority for nourishment because it's not a survival thing. Your prefrontal cortex is for quote, ex executive control, like social control, distinguishing between right and wrong, uh, being able to have forethought, like to map out, okay, if I do this thing, if I, if I act this way, I'm gonna get this result. I don't want that to happen, let me not do it. Mm -hmm. So that part of the brain, when it's undernourished, oh man, we can really run into a lot of problems. So there it is kind of in black and white, um, how, how our nutrition really does affect our ability to perspective take, empathy, aggression. It's a very real thing. And my mission is to get our citizens healthier so we can start to have healthier conversations. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, so you mentioned like, is it the prefrontal cortex? It, it's, uh, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't work as well when you're eating garbage food. Does, does, the, does the amygdala um, get more activated or something? Do you start thinking more with that? And th does this make sense? <laughs> Do you, Absolutely. Uh, yeah? Do you yeah. start, does it kind of operate that way? Do you, is it less of prefrontal and more amygdala or something like that? Or This is know. great. Yeah, we're able to actually look and see. This is the thing. Like, I don't want to just guess. Mm. I want to find out. I want to work with researchers who are actually looking at MRIs, who are using SPECT imaging to see the impact that our nutrition has on the brain. Let's not just guess about it. And the, it is absolutely mind-blowing when you see some of this stuff how it plays out in the real world with our brains and so yes and there's, so there's the brain the human brain is incredible again most complicated object in the known universe okay. but we know certain principles about it but we still we know next to nothing you know so we've got these kind of they've evolved like brains on top of brains in a sense you know we've got all these different aspects prefrontal cortex the amygdala basal ganglia all these different names uh, the medulla oblongata, like if anybody saw Waterboy, the movie with Adam Sandler, it's like, something's wrong with your medulla oblongata. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so this part of the brain, when we're nutrient deprived, again, unfortunately, your body works on kind of a hierarchy of needs. And so other processes and places in your body get nutrition first. It's a priority. Like, for example, um, your, your, your uh, absorption of calcium, for example, you need calcium to clot your blood. You need calcium for so many different processes, but we just think about bones. We've got data now that your body will literally leach calcium and leach nutrients from your bones to aid in other processes, specifically from your spine and your hips. And I think my spine is pretty damn important, but there's a hierarchy of needs. And the problem is we're so nutrient deficient that we force our body to do these things. Your body doesn't want to do that. But if we're not providing our bodies with the raw materials that it needs to do these processes, then we're gonna to start to fall apart. And so, yeah, so the activity of the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain can start to go cold or like just massively reduce activity when we're def deficient in key nutrients for the brain. And we see heightened activity in the more emotional and reactive parts of the brain that actually drive us to do whatever is necessary. Like literally, in a sense, kind of, if we have to kill, to be able to survive and get the nutrients to our brain and our bodies that we need, 
that part of the brain becomes hyperactive, mm. right? So this is, creates the more aggressive behavior. And so, yeah, that is one of the things. And also one of the things that you, researchers at UC Berkeley did some brain imaging and found that just one night of sleep deprivation created a dramatic decrease in activity in the prefrontal cortex. And the part, the amygdala was just on fire. You know, we called it a, a, an amygdala hijack. That part of the brain lights up and it's just like, okay, who wants to party? Who wants to fight? Mm. Right? So yeah, it's very real. Very, very real. You mentioned something about the, uh, the prisoners. They, you know, with the experiment, some were given nutritious diet with the uh, omega-3s, did you say? But I know they yes, have some- This uh, is, yeah, critical. Yeah nutritious diet and the others um they had a placebo did they have a placebo or and right, were, yeah. were, were there were there um moods and everything still the same were they still i don't know acting like killers and stuff the ones with the placebo. <laughs> <laughs> so here this man I'm so, this i love you dude this is such a great question nobody nobody has asked me this question nobody's asked me this question this is so powerful because the numbers that I gave, that was not based on the comparison to the placebo group. That was overall, right? That was overall versus their baseline at the beginning of the study. They, they did radically improve from the placebo group, but mm -hmm. the placebo group improved as well. Mm -hmm. And this talks about the power of the placebo. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this in the book as well towards the end of how our psychology controls our biology right? Because truly every thought that we have has correlating chemistry released in our body, right? So if we have thoughts, we start to think of stressful things, we start to produce more stress-related hormones and it changes what our neuro neurotransmitters are doing. It literally changes us based on our thinking. It's powerful, man. Our brain is really the most powerful pharmacy in the world. And yeah. I say that specifically because it's creating chemicals that fit specifically for your receptor sites. It's just, man, but here's the thing the very best type of study that we have is a randomized control, control placebo controlled study. But we have to control for the placebo. We have to account for the placebo effect because on average in clinical trials, placebos are 33% effective on average. And this is never talked about. That means if somebody thinks that they're taking a drug, they're part of a study to, to, to reduce their blood pressure, their hypertension, 33% of people on average get results. Their blood sugar normalizes, their blood pressure normalizes. We even have, and this is so crazy what I'm about to say, but if people wanna look more into this, it is remarkable. You can look up some studies and see this, but it's really hard to, to grasp that this is possible. But somebody believing that they're receiving chemotherapy and the proceeding to have their hair fall out and their cancer tumor dissolving based on their belief, this is some, I'm a, I'm a very logical, analytical person. So it took me a while to accept this. Like it had to be seeing is believing, mm -hmm. but it exists. It absolutely exists. And, you know, same thing, sleep deprivation, you know, insomnia, folks battling with depression. There's one study found a placebo to be 80% effective in reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression. So the list goes on and on. Placebo is very, very powerful. Just the belief that we're taking something that's going to change our behavior. The other side of that, though, can be the negative, kind of the dark shadow of the placebo effect. It's called the nocebo effect. Okay. This is when you get a negative injunction that something bad is going to happen. Like the doctor tells you, you have, you know, you'll never walk again. You're going to be on medication for the rest of your life. You have six weeks to live. I just shared a study on Instagram uh, as of this recording. It's probably about a week and a half ago because there was a physician on TV saying something very, very dangerous to the population here in Los Angeles. It sh I couldn't believe that this was being broadcast on television. And I coupled it, I shared, I had to share his exact clip. Like I couldn't just say that he said this shit, I had to share it. Mm. And then I shared two powerful studies talking about how physicians need to be better trained on the language that they use because of the negative side effects that they were causing in patients and all of the mountains of data documenting this. Mm. Because again, the power of suggestion and the power of our minds believing something, changing our biochemistry, right? So 
Thank you for asking that question. It's so overlooked. The study that I shared in the book really highlighting this is from Dr. Alia Crum and her crew at Stanford. Mm. And there was a study that found that basically telling somebody the calorie content of their food, even though it was the same calorie content, if they tell, told somebody that it was more calories than it really was, and they told some other people that there was a far less calories than it really was, the people who thought they just believed there is more calories, their bodies released more leptin, which is a satiety hormone, and their ghrelin, this hormone that drives us to eat, radically decreased. So they felt more satisfied and more, less likely to overeat or to eat sooner in the future because of their belief. And the people who believe that their food was less calories than it really was, their ghrelin levels stayed the same. They didn't get any additional satisfaction. They're far more likely to overeat and eat again sooner after based on their damn thoughts. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I can go on and on with this one, man. It's very powerful. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think, I think a moment ago you said you're, you're a very logical person. And sometimes I think um, people with different professions may say something at a different angle, but they kind of cross over each other in, in they kind of almost achieve the same result, but they explain it in a different way. Now, when I say that, I mean, like, I was recently listening to this audio book by, uh, what's his name? Um, shaman Durek. Do you know Shaman Durek? He's, yeah. he's a shaman. And um, close the door, please. Sorry, the daughter trying to get involved. Um, he's a shaman and he talks about uh spirit worlds and um do, do you believe that we're in a, a in a, a multi-dimensional universe or do you just believe in earth and and that's it is where is your mind at with that is, is it something you'd prefer to not talk about <laughs> no I, this again this is why i love talking with you man to ask questions like this because everybody has a perspective on these things we should talk about it you know especially for myself there's an there's an argument of nature versus nurture, why I'm so logical and analytical, mm -hmm. but I am. My tendency is towards that. However, I mentioned this earlier, there is so much we don't know. We know, we know nothing, really, in the grand scheme of things. The top person in any profession will just say immunology or virology, since that's a very important topic right now. Yeah. The very best person in the world knows less than a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent about all the viruses there are and how they work. We don't know shit. We really <laughs> truly don't. And so when we talk about, you know, multidimensional uh, realities, the vastness of our universe itself is unbelievable. We have billions of galaxies in the known universe. Yeah. Do, you, do you, the ramifications of that, that's not just a planet. We're talking about galaxies of planets, billions of them. It's, we know nothing. And then when we talk, get into the conversation, if anybody wants to dive into this, this has helped me to really understand that it's not only possible, but, but probable is studying some quantum dynamics, quantum physics. You know, this is where it was kind of leaning towards. Yeah. We talk about Max Planck and we talk about, you know, Einstein. There's so many different things that should be the top science. Everything should filter down to that, but we're still doing so much based on Newtonian science, like, you know, gravity, you see, what you see is what you get. But there's so much we can't see. And as we start to see more, then we think that we solved the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So now we've zoomed in and we found, okay, now we found these viruses, we found virus particles, but we're gonna keep digging and looking, for, we're gonna find eventually viruses have viruses, right? <laughs> because we actually, we found that bacteria have viruses because first it was bacteria that we discovered. But with, now we know they're called bacteriophages or bacteriophages, depending on you know where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. And we found that these bacteria actually can get infected by viruses. And this is some early forms of medicine that we were using, was uh, using basically viral implantation into bacteria to kill bacteria infections, all right? So please understand, and by, here's the craziest part. You can fit hundreds, even potentially thousands of viruses inside of one bacteria cell, all right? Wow. It's insane how mm -hmm. tiny these things are, but I we're gonna find something else. And we're gonna be like, oh, this is it. We <laughs> finally discovered what the root cause of disease is. Instead of understanding, we are a part of something so massive 
in both directions from the microscopic to the meta, you know, all the way in and out. And we are just a piece of it. We're a small part of this web. Mm. And the more we can kind of grasp that, the more that we can start to see, okay, I need to back off here, acting like I know what, what's happening. What we do know, what we are aware of is, is that there are principles associated with health, principles associated with our plane of reality, right? Things that we know our DNA expect us to do, mm. and to see it thrive, right? To see our genetics, you know, our outpicturing, right? These epigenetic controllers of our best expression. We know that we require movement. We require oxygen. We require sunlight. We require key nutrients that we've identified. But there's, again, there's a hundred times more that we still don't know yet. But if we can engage with these things and be very cautious when anybody's advocating, be it a government body or a friend, to pull ourselves away from the things that our genes expect us to do, what's going to be the ramifications of that? Right. So, yeah, it's getting into another conversation. But yeah, man, I mean, it's it's yes. To answer the question in short, yes, there is so much more. There are different fields of reality. Yeah. You know, there's different, uh, you know, of course, like just universally speaking, there's just so much that we that we don't know. And, and so, it's so vast. Yeah. Like if we was to talk about the, the, the quantum realm, um, you know, it's believed that you know, by certain um, sh um, shamans that if you, if you say certain things, you can bring it into existence. Like you're bringing it into the, um, you know, it's like, if you say certain good things or certain bad things, it's going to affect you. You know, whether you are, you know, uh, fitter or sicker, it, it just, it's a, it's a case of what you say. So it's, it, when I say that it's um, it's almost like they cross over each other. When you talk about placebo, and and then you've got the other side where they say um, it's not just about what you're thinking, but it's it's something which is in the quantum realm, and it and it, it you're bringing it into existence. So you know you can speak it out, or you can think on it and bring it into existence. But, you know, on the science aspect, they'll look at it a bit different, if that makes sense. It's like they both reach at the same point, but they got different explanations as to how they reach there. If that makes sense. Um, of course, of course. Yeah. But it's, it, uh, I would like to, I would really like you to check out uh, Shaman Durek's book. It's just, it's insane. It's insane. It's It's something completely different. It's not your typical stuff that you would have, learned from your um, nutrition courses and stuff like that. It's very different. Um, let's, let's talk about um, uh, food and um, psychology. Like why are food and psychology so closely connected? I think we probably covered some of that, isn't it? Yeah, that's again, this is what we touched on a little bit with Dr. Elia Crumb's study, for example. You know, our, they both, they feed both directions though. It's, it's bi-directional. Mm -hmm. Our psychology determines our food choices and our food choices determine what our psychology is doing. So yeah. they go both ways, right? But we generally, again, we try to treat one thing, right? Somebody has an issue with food, right? And we try to treat that, that, that maybe we'll just say an addiction. We try to treat the surface thing of the addiction and not actually work on the food itself and how that might change the person's psychology, because the biggest tenet, and this is one of the big takeaways from today, and this is, I mean, this is incredibly powerful if we can get this, the number one driving force for all of us, everything that we do in our lives, every thought we have, every habit, every action we take, the number one driving force of the human psyche is to stay congruent with who we believe ourselves to be, all right? That drives everything about us. We do things in association with we who we believe ourselves to be. I'm the type of person that, you know, fill in the blank. So the way that we eat, we eat based on who we see ourselves as. We might not consciously be aware of it. And this is where the, 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 the change fundamentally, the people that are really great at 
encouraging and inspiring transformation, work with people on this level of helping them to shift their identity because it creates, that's the tip of the spear, creating the, the choices. But changing the identity is incredibly difficult if you're in the same environment that might, you might be inundated or immersed in sickness and things that encourage disease and health. I'm from Ferguson, Missouri. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, right? It's become national news, like because of different, you know, political issues and violence. But I was inundated with sickness. Like every, as soon as I walk out my door, I, I didn't know what organic meant. I didn't know that there was, I didn't quote healthy food. I just thought there was some lettuce and that was the end of the story, you know? But for me, I didn't have access. And so to change my identity, sometimes it might be considered to take a miracle, but I promise you the solution, number one, it's, all, it's always exposure. Just even a little bit of exposure could transform somebody's life to see what can be, what my identity might be able to, to become. So that's number one. Um, but also just that kind of proactive, just being aware, like we, what I just shared, that our identity is controlling our, our, our actions and our thoughts. Once you become aware of that, you can get in there in your brain and start to shift things around. You might realize like, I've been seeing myself as, you know, something from my programming. You know, maybe I was given a hard time in high school. You know, maybe I was picked on or maybe I, I didn't, I wasn't very liked. I felt like I, I wanted people to like me. And this has outpictured itself in different ways and how I operate as an adult, right? But now you realize like, wait a minute, I don't have to, I don't have to have that perception about myself anymore. I can see, I can start to see myself as somebody who is exceedingly confident and strong and capable, right? And but it's not lying to yourself. You it, like this whole quote, fake it till you make it. You be it, you just become it. Yeah. And this is the other thing is like, be it till you see it. But truly, like, how does that person, if I see myself as a more confident person or somebody who eats really great food or prioritizes movement, how does that person, how does that person walk? How does a person talk? How does that, what does that person eat? What does that person do to start their day, mm. right? You start to identify those behavior traits and you be it. You can just start to implement those things and, and shift in your psychology there too. So again, it's multi-directional on how our psychology affects the impact that food has on our body and how uh, our, our beliefs about ourselves affect our proclivity towards you know, certain foods in the first place. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can identify in both ways. Like I know that I envision myself, like when I was younger, I envisioned myself being a sprinter. And I, because of that, I just naturally gravitated to certain things which I felt was gonna be good for me to achieve like the fast results of being a sprinter. And I also am aware of how I feel when I eat certain shitty foods. I remember one time I was in the town and I was feeling hungry. I'd fasted for quite a few hours. And my first, my first bite was um like a, a pie i think it was like a a chicken and mushroom pie and I, and then after i ate that i was like mm, that was nice do you know what let me go and get a sausage roll i then had an appetite to get more shit food so i got a sausage roll and then after that there was some other garbage which i bought i can't remember what it was but what i remember after that was when i got home I, um, I took my phone to a, a phone repair shop to, to get fixed. When I got home, it wasn't working. And I was furious. I was so furious that I'd never been that furious before for, forever, <laughs> forever. It's like I was so completely out of character. I called the shop and I was shouting down the phone. And I felt like I... <laughs> I couldn't control myself, you know? And, and when the conversation was done, I'm like, my God, why am I feeling like this? I felt rage, so much rage, like so much rage. I was like, I need to drive down to the shop and I need to burn this shop. Like I was thinking all this <laughs> oh seriously. And I'm like, yeah. but that is so out of character. I am never like that ever. Yeah. And you know, it, it occurred to me that mm. 
I ate some garbage food and I'm like, wow, how, how come it had such a strong impact on me? And I think maybe it was because I fasted and literally that was all I ate and it just took, took control. Um, so I'm very particular with the food that I put in my body. Uh, if my daughter has something sweet, I see how she goes sometimes. She starts like, ah, she wants she wants more of it. I'm like, no, 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 you're not having more. It's almost like trying to trying to wean her off cocaine or something like that, you know? Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely fully aware of, you know, the psychology of food. Have you had anything like that yourself where it's affected you, where you're like, damn, like, I wouldn't normally do that. You know, or you, you know, you might be a bit abrupt with your words to someone because of certain foods that you've eaten. Have you had that before? Yeah. Or you're completely in control. This is such, man, listen, it happens to everybody. <laughs> right. <okay>. Listen, <laughs> but your story is so, thank you for sharing that. That's powerful, you know, for folks to be able to, to, to identify that. And absolutely, you know, there was a little bit of a, a consistency that my wife and I would see because when we were living in Missouri, the gym, like we lived pretty far from, you know, really everything uh, for a little bit of time. And the gym was like a 20, 25 minute drive. And but we would go to the gym early in the morning to drop my son off at his school. And so like we would just have a little bit, maybe, you know, maybe some uh, quote fast mimicking nutrients, like some MCT oil with some green tea or some coffee or something like that. But cool, you know, we're good, do our workout. But this might, we would just say maybe that's at like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. We get done dropping him off, which his, to get to his school, 45 minutes. By the time we get home to get our first nutrition in, it might be 10 o'clock. And we kept getting into conflicts on the drive home, right? And we're just like about little, cause we're talking about little stuff of the day, but we're just a little snappy, you know, a little, little aggressive. And we realized, well, I, I give all credit to my wife all the time. Let me just be clear. Mm -hmm. But I happened to realize that this, this was happening when we were hungry, right? Like our bodies, we had just even done this workout. It's a lot of, you know, cortisol and, you know, adrenaline's going. Mm -hmm. We love each other, man. She's my best friend. So it's like, why are we getting pissed off about these, the most stupid things as well, you know? And so being aware of that still to this day, I, and I talked, I literally talk about this in the book. I talk about this thing to be able to check in with yourself whenever you are having a conflict because it, it can feel like that other person is totally against you. Yeah. But the reality is chances are there, you guys are on the same team and your perception is a bit, bit skewed right now. And so, but it takes some work to be able to, in that moment, to do a self, uh, to self-reflect, to self-analyze, a self-assessment. Am I hungry? You know, did I, did I eat well? Am I tired, right? Am I, you know, am I sleep deprived? That's a big, big driver of aggressive behavior. Um, is my partner tired? Are they bothering me that I'm bringing into this situation, right? To be able to self-assess so that we can better manage our relationships. So yeah, absolutely. This has happened to me, happens to all of us from time to time, but now we can just be more aware. And I know we're getting close here on our time to wrap up, but yeah. this is such an important conversation for us to talk about and to have that self-awareness moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, th thanks for sharing that as well. MCT as well. That's interesting because I, th <laughs> I think, like if you're fasting and you have coffee and an MCT, it's like it, it that's what people do to um, uh, increase autophagy as well, isn't it? Yeah, we talk about all that in yeah. Eat Smarter because it all the data exists. It's mm -hmm. not that I'm some advocate or trying to be a big fan of these things. It's just so shocking how much data we have on certain nutrients helping certain processes. You know, whether it's issues, you know, things that we're trying to adjust with our metabolism and what these quote fat loss related hormones, how specific nutrients drive those things and foods to find them in. You know, in autophagy, this cellular cleansing process you know like especially for our brains and getting rid of all the metabolic waste because again it's doing trillions of processes one of the biggest issues we're seeing today skyrocketing rates of alzheimer's and one of the hallmarks of alzheimer's that we now know is an inability of the brain to clean itself right so it's just this buildup in in waste 
right? And the human, the, the human brain, the glymphatic system that manages this cleansing, the glial cells, it's 10 times more active when you're asleep than when you're awake. So this points to, again, our massive increase in sleep deprivation being a major causative factor in our cognitive decline, you know? So yeah, that's the, really the list interesting. Goes on on. Um, okay. I know that I've done, done a genetics test and I know I've got one copy of the APOE4 um, gene, you know, APOE4, yeah? Um, I think that that makes you at a slightly higher risk. So I do try to, I don't know, try to avoid certain crappy food. And I'm always conscious about what's going on with my head. How am I feeling? Am I sleepy? Um, also, another good practice is um, just some sort of cognitive training, like doing stuff to get the brain working as well, as far as I'm aware. I've got like a, a few brain training games. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, so um, I think we've done good. We've done good. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think we've sure. done good, man. We've done good. So um, thank you very much for your time. Seriously, Sean, it's been amazing. So um, I'm definitely going to grab a copy of your book. I need, I, need, I need to check it out. Do you have a podcast yourself? Of course, yeah. Very grateful to say um, it's called the, the Model Health Show. And okay. it's been the number one health podcast in the US many, many times, which is crazy to say. Again, I'm just from middle America, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, but, you know, we have a good time and we talk about all manner of health and wellness. You know, some interesting things like you're, this is what I like about what you're doing is things that you might not even necessarily relate to health, but they contribute to our overall mental health, physical health. You know, so really we look at every dynamic of your life, you know, your, 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 uh, Fitness, of course, but how can you be more emotionally fit, mentally fit, yeah. right? Relationship fitness, you know, and talking to some of the top experts in that space as well. So, yeah, we have a really good time there for sure. That's good, man. That's good. And um, you're on Instagram as well. What do you go by on Instagram? I'm at Sean Model. So it's S H A W N Model. And yeah, now I'm finally, I'm very one of those people. I don't want to get onto new things. But, you know, my team finally got me on to it this past year. So we do a lot of cool stuff on IG now. It's pretty fun, too. That's awesome. You on Facebook as well? Facebook at The Model Health Show the on Model Facebook. Health. Cool, yeah. cool. What about Twitter? Twitter, I'm at Sean Model. I'll pop in there with random stuff, as yeah. I think most people do. But, you know, again, I'll pop in there and have some fun, too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And your website is? themodelhealthshow.com. Okay. And folks can find the book at eatsmarterbook.com as well. And just anywhere books are sold, depending on where you are as well. Here in the US, anywhere books are sold. Uh, in the UK, there are some workarounds to get a copy now. You get digital and audio book, but the publishing will be there uh, just within the next couple of months. So officially launched in UK and Australia too. Splendid. Did you just say you've got an audio book? That's right. Yeah. Oh That's my God. <laughs> I'm getting that one. <laughs> you got a brilliant voice. I'm just going to get that one. I'm better with audio books anyway. Uh, I might, I might pick up the print version by the audio. Look, Sean, thank you so much for your time, sir. I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been phenomenal, my friend. I truly appreciate it. Thank you it. so much for having me. Thank you for the wonderful questions and thank you for the work that you're doing, man. Truly. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. I hope to see you at some point in the future when all this lockdown malarkey is finished. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. I would have been there already. We had an event uh, that was going to be there in 2020, but, you know, got rescheduled. But sooner than later, I'll be out there. Yeah, it'd be great, man. It'd be great to catch up. Uh, again, thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. My pleasure. I'll send this audio file to my team and they'll get over to you as well. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. All right. You take, take care, care, man. Please.